Hello. Hi. As many of you guys know, we're getting really close to becoming foster parents. And we wanted to make a little video to answer a couple questions that you guys might have about what is foster care? Why are we doing this? Um, and just ask each other some questions that we thought you might have for us. Um, so we're gonna jump right in. Uh, Luke, what is foster care? So foster care is a government uh, created program to help uh, children whose parents can't parent them um, for, for a period of time. And uh, it's not, you know, the parent or caregiver deciding that they can't parent their child, but, but rather it's the government deciding, you know, a policeman, the police or judge deciding that um, this parent is not uh, fit to be a caregiver for uh, their children right now, um, perhaps because the uh, per parent is uh, using drugs or uh, in jail or involved with some other crime or perhaps because there's been neglect or abuse against the child. And so the, the child or children need to be removed from the home um, and they're placed with a foster family like us. Uh, it could be a single child or a sibling group of several children. Um, and you know, the hope is, is that it's uh, just temporary. We get to be their parents um, and uh, take care of them uh, and you know, help them grow while their uh, parents and caregivers um, you know, fix anything crime related and usually go through uh, some court mandated steps uh, to learn how to become a, you know, a better parent. Um, and the, the hope is that uh, eventually the parent makes enough progress that the children get to go back and, you know, live with them forever again. Great. Are there any stats that you know about foster care? Yes, there are. So 400,000 kids are in foster care in the U.S. right now, a giant amount. Um, that's one in every 200 children in the U.S. is a foster child. Um, uh, uh, you know, a heartbreaking stat is that um, virtually all of these children uh, have experienced childhood trauma. Um, Bethany and I have recently learned about something called the, ad, the ACE, ACE, Adverse Childhood Experiences Scale, which is a scientifically developed scale that um, defines different, defines childhood trauma. And um, the higher someone lands on that scale, um, the more likely they are just statistically to experience some really negative um, uh, health and effects later in life and other uh, just uh, negative outcomes. And uh, sadly, virtually all uh, foster children, you know, fall on this scale and, and many fall very high. Um, and then a final kind of uh, heartbreaking stat is that 20% of foster children um, become homeless. So imagine one in five people you know and love and care about becoming homeless. That would be tragic, uh, but that's happening to this uh, population. Uh, so Bethany, um, why do you want to become a foster parent? Um, lots of reasons. I guess uh, after hearing about adoption and foster care and then becoming a mom myself, just thinking about some kids not having a parent that they can attach to and feel safe with and feel loved um, just made me kind of pulls on my heart and makes me want to help them and bring them into our home where we're just really blessed to have a lot of just love and care going on and a lot of resources and support. And so I just feel like our family has so much that others have poured into us and that God has given us that we just feel like it's our, our job and our duty to share that with other people. Um, yeah, and also just learning about with these traumatic experiences that the kids have experienced, um, just seeing the research on how once there is a healthy caregiver for the kids to attach to, then a lot of things can start to be healed. Um, and so just seeing how important that is and that there's a huge 
need for that, for there to be a good, safe foster home. Um, so yeah, it just seems like there's a lot of good to be done and a huge need. And it uh, seems like in the home where there's a lot of love and support going on, um, seems like the perfect place for a lot of this healing to happen instead of some office somewhere or a clinic somewhere. So yeah, what about you? Why do you want to be a foster parent? Um, because, I mean, we love children and we wanted we want to be parents um, to, you know, big group of kids, maybe four, five kids, who knows? Um, ten. Ten. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, and I, I've always wanted, I've always been really interested in a, adoption ever since I was a kid and thought that would be such a cool way to love people and to serve. Um, and, uh, it just makes a lot of sense to me to use some of our energy, um, as parents and our, and our love and some of our, you know, roster spots, if you will, for children in our family, um, to serve children who, you know, already exist and are, um, going through, you know, are, are, are some of the, the least of these, as Jesus would say, and, uh, really need our love. That seems like a really great way to um, love and serve others, uh, perhaps even better than having more biological children. Um, also just been really, uh, yeah, inspired that the most important thing for children to overcome these adverse childhood experiences is to have a loving, attuned uh, adult presence and caregiver in their life. Uh, that they trust and who cares about them. Um, uh, so Bethany, why are the children removed from their parents and uh, where are they removed from? So it will just be children in our county. It won't be from overseas or other states. It's just our local foster care system. Um, and like Luke said earlier, they were moved for usually cases of abuse or neglect. Um, I think in California, if it's just a problem of low income, like someone is homeless or they're having trouble making enough money to buy food, then children aren't, I think they can't be removed for that. They are just provided those services so that the kids don't have to be removed. Um, so how long do the children stay at our house? And the children might be coming to us directly from their parents, or they might have been with another foster family for some amount of time first, and then coming to us as next foster family. Right. Uh, the children, how long do they stay? Um, you know, we don't know uh, when a child comes to stay with us. Um, there, there's no way to know uh, how long they'll be with us. Um, it could be you know, short, best case scenario, maybe a couple months. Um, it could be um, longer, it could take, you know, a year or more um, for the parent to earn their parental rights back. Um, or it could be forever uh, if, if um, their, the parent or caregiver passes away or um, loses their parental rights. Um, um, and you know it can it can always um, stop in in the middle. Um, like if it's not working out, then the child may need to leave our house sooner. And actually, the parents they keep their rights, but I guess they're just kind of suspended temporarily, um, unless yeah, like you said, they're not following their plan, and then a judge can decide that it's time to terminate the parents' rights, and then the kid comes up for adoption but yeah oftentimes we don't know all so, the details and sometimes the caseworker doesn't want to share all the details or they're keeping it confidential so they may say this is only two weeks and it turns into two years so can um can the kids be adopted um they could be adopted so yeah if the the parent is not doing the classes or um working on their drug addiction 
or maybe they're in jail for an indefinite amount of time. Um, just different things like this could lead to the parents' rights being terminated, and then they start looking for an adoptive family. And then for us, we could decide yes or no if we want to adopt them. We don't have to say yes. Um, and we get to decide and pray about if it's a good fit for our family. Um, or they'll have to look for a different family, which again would be more trauma to be removed. Each time a kid is removed from a home, it's just more trauma. So if some kids are bouncing around to 10, 20 different homes because of different problems or someone doesn't want to adopt them. It's just kind of compounding the trauma. Um, so kind of at the beginning and as we're working through each placement, we want to have in the back of our mind, is this a good fit for us if this turns into adoption? But mostly the goal is always reunify with the family because it's much better for a kid to be with his mom and dad if they're safe. Um, so that's the goal that we all want to be working towards. And we have ways that we can try to be supportive of the, the biological parents by just sending pictures and notes and just encouraging words, just to try to just encourage them along the way as they're doing this hard thing of trying to get over addiction and get their kids back and get clean and get their life in order. So I think we always want to be really supportive of that along the way and not bad mouthing them and hoping we get to keep their kid or anything like that. Um, and sometimes, I mean, it's, it's uncommon, but sometimes we'll get, um, a placement where they already know, you know, when, when they, uh, place the kid, child with us that the child needs adoption or will likely need adoption. So sometimes, you know, from the get go, but usually you don't find out until, you know, a year or more in the think process. You said earlier, they're gonna look at all different, um, family members and see if someone is willing to take them like a grandparent or aunt mm -hmm. and uncle because they would like the kid to stay within the family. A few interesting uh, facts about adoption is the adoption is um, is very low cost and, and my, my work pays for up to 10k of cost which would weigh well more than cover it. Um, uh, as contrasted with a domestic adoption, which is 20 to 30K or, or an international adoption, which costs 30 to 50K or more. Um, so it's not an expensive, you know, big expensive adoption like you may have heard about. Um, and also the child, uh, any child who ends up in foster care in California gets free uh, public uh, college in California. So they can go to any you know, CU school, like Berkeley, UCLA, or Cal State, like Cal uh, San Luis Obispo for free. How old will the kids be that will be coming into your home, our home? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, important uh, constraint, um, some important constraints for me and Bethany that the kids are, um, you know, younger than Clive, um, so we don't, um, you know, we want to keep Clive the oldest and biggest. Um, we've heard that's best psychologically. It's also, um, just good for his safety, um, that, cause he'll be, you know, bigger than the, the children coming in and perhaps Tove also. Um, so we're looking at zero to five. That's uh, also the age range that zero we're, to four. zero to four. It's also the age range that we're, uh, comfortable, uh, with since we already have experience. Um, can you say no to a placement call for a child? Yes, so. And maybe you wanna just explain how the, pla what, is, what is a placement call? Yeah, so the, there'll be some report of abuse or neglect, neglect by someone in the community about this bio, biological family and then CPS will go and do a whole investigation. And if they decide the kids need to be removed, they'll remove them. And usually they'll go to some kind of um, office where they're processing them in and filling out paperwork and then making calls to all these different foster families to say, hello, we have this two-year-old who was just removed and we don't know how long it will be. Can you take him and can we drop him off in two hours? Um, or 
later today around dinner time um, or it'll be a midnight call in the middle of the night um, and so it's often kind of a quick in the moment decision and we'll probably just have time to talk with each other for a few minutes and then say yes or no because they're going to keep calling different families um, until they find somebody and so we can say yes or no we can say no we all have covid and we're going to be sick for weeks probably so it's not a good time we got to say no or we're about to go out of town for a week it's not a good time or one of us is having chronic pain or busy time at work or we're just not at a good place as a family i mean most of the time we want to say yes because we're wanting to be helpful and open to it but if for whatever reason it's just not a good season for us we're allowed to say no um yeah. Also, if they say this is a child that has extreme medical needs that require probably up to this many hours a day, we can also, it's something we also would say probably no to because we already have um, our own kids and job and maybe are not able to do that. Or if it's a kid, maybe that a four-year-old that's been removed from three different foster homes because of aggressive behavior we can say our home is not a good fit for that either. So there's different things that we could say uh, automatic no. Or if they say, we have a 10 year old, we know you only want zero to four, but please, please, we can also say we're not ready for that. Um, will you know why the child was removed from their home? Um, it depends. Um, sometimes we might, but uh, often uh, we don't, right? Yeah, I think a lot of times we're left in the dark and we maybe can ask around if we like find it out over time, but sometimes they just don't want to tell us. Um, yeah, and even if we do know, it's uh, really important that we keep it confidential just to not, of course, share this family's business. Yeah, and actually like um, yeah, confidentiality is a big part of it. So we're, uh, you know, not allowed to post pictures of uh, with the kid on social media, I think. Um, and we're not supposed to go around trumpeting like this is a foster child to like every stranger we meet, mm -hmm. I think. Right. Um, did I ask you that one? Yeah. Um, Secrets that. Uh, do all of the children have behavior problems? Um, I will say I mean, children in general all have difficult behaviors that they're working through at different developmental stages. I can't say that our kids don't ever have behavioral problems, and but a massive you, trauma, massive uh, tantrum. Yeah. Tonight that took like ten minutes for Cloud to calm down. Yeah, I guess if you're thinking behavioral problems where they can't really function in school and they're injuring pets and other kids, um, no, not every kid will have that. Um, it's just kind of different for each kid. But like we said earlier, they have experienced trauma and often trauma comes out in these intense behaviors. And maybe it could be a three-year-old that doesn't really know how to talk much yet and hasn't been paid attention and their needs haven't been met. And so the way that they get attention is by breaking things or screaming or drawing on the walls or different things. And so just realizing they're really not coming to the the playing field with the same tools that everyone else has um, and so sometimes their trauma is going to come out in different behaviors so we're definitely expecting that um, and hoping to look past that to see what is this need that's going on um, but yeah so it's some may have severe behavior issues that we'll have to work through or some other family might be better working through that with them and then some of them may be it's not affecting them in this very outward way. And follow up to that, what are you doing to prepare for that? We're reading and watching lots of videos about um, kind of trauma-based parenting and trauma-based discipline um, that kind of are teaching us what I was saying, like the behavior is communicating a need versus this is just an evil kid and this kid is manipulating me and they're just a little devil that wants to hurt our kids like all of them are children that are just 
trying to survive, and this is how they've learned to survive, is by doing whatever they can to get their needs met. Um, so yeah, I think all the training that we've been getting deep into has been kind of changing that mindset and trying to look at the whole child and think about what they, what they need. Yeah, like I'm reading my fourth book this year on parenting and and or trauma and you like you've done a whole um, expensive course by some doctors on trauma based parenting. Mm -hmm. um, how is your life going to change after bringing a foster child into your home? Yeah, I mean, it definitely changes just like having another kid would 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 change it. Um, you know, I, uh, like we'll we'll definitely see like I think we expect that uh, um, you know the first placement or first will be the might be the most shocking or or like over time if we have more placements um, you know we we may grow uh, better and more used to how life changes when a child comes into our home um, but you know I think. Um, in addition to having another kid or, or, or kids around and then, you know, needing to, um, like, uh, invest time and energy into parenting that child, um, uh, we, we have to take that child for visits with, uh, their parent or parents. Um, that often starts out as once a week or, or even less. Um, and over time that would get more frequent uh, as the parent progresses along their plan. Um, the child might have, uh, you know, might already be in um, some sort of school uh, or, or daycare program, who, who knows, um, or we might put them in one uh, and take them to that. The child may have um, uh, medical or uh, therapy or counseling uh, visits that we take them to um, and you know I think we expect that like at least for these first this first placement um, when we get a child we'll uh, for the first time we'll I'll take some time off work and we'll um, um, probably be more um, a little more focused inward on our family for the first few months and maybe doing fewer things outside the home than we normally do. Um, and traveling does become a bit harder. It does become harder with foster kids because there's just approvals we need to get for any overnight travel. Um, so we plan to travel you know, less than we have been in the past. And, and part of that is we've traveled a lot this year, kind of expecting that, knowing, hey, we're gonna travel less in the future. So that's why we went to I forget, like five, five, six, seven different trips this year so far. Um, are you worried about keeping Clive and Tove safe? Um, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, kind of what we talked about good earlier. Good question, you wrote it. <laughs> giving yourself a pat on the back. It is a good question. What does safe mean? <laughs> um, <laughs> our, like I talked about earlier, we said if it's a kid that there's been like kind of a history of maybe like violence with other kids, then one way of keeping them safe is just saying that's that can't work in our house. Or if we do bring in a kid and find out that just they're not being able to be redirected away from hurting our kids or hurting in the house, hurting things around the house, um, that just even with everything that we're doing and working with therapists and working with the social workers and it's just not getting better that we'll, we're able to disrupt the placement and then ask that they be moved to a different foster family. Um, so I guess I'm not worried about keeping them safe, um, but it is one of my major goals. And I mean, in life in general, one of my big jobs is keeping them safe and it will continue to be my job to keep them safe. Um, but at the same time, we are happy to introduce them to this challenge of loving kids and being around kids from hard places and just letting them see what our Christian faith 
looks like lived out by getting near to people with probably really messy backgrounds um, that are really different from us, that probably look different from us and have a whole different family culture than we do and um, just different behaviors than they're used to. So I think all of that to me seems a huge benefit to their childhood. And at the same time, I wanna balance that with keeping them physically, emotionally safe because it doesn't make sense to traumatize these two kids um, just to help alleviate someone else's trauma. So I want to keep everyone's trauma to a minimum. Yeah, they'll definitely <laughs> learn a lot. Um, and you know, there's there's a chance, like we've heard stories of a foster kid coming into the home and they've learned, you know, some things you wouldn't expect such a young kid to know about and might just start talking about them you know, by virtue of their kind of family situation and, and their parents before. Um, and we've definitely heard people having to have talks with their children and teach their children things a few years earlier than they were would otherwise expect, plan to. Um, but you know, I think that that's fine. We haven't heard of any of that backfiring. And like Bethany said, the, the flip side is that they get to learn so many unique and hands-on lessons that uh, especially about serving and loving others that are, are just going to be so good for their um, development spiritually and emotionally as a loving you know, caring follower of, of christ i can tackle these last two questions you asked me that one yes um uh, why do you love Luke and what are your favorite qualities about him? <laughs> Just That's kidding. Not the <laughs> what are things that we should talk about and do with foster kids if we get to meet them? Good question. We being not us. We if you guys get to meet them, what are some do's and don'ts? The next one is what are things we should not do with the foster kid? Let's knock out the knots first. Um, let's see if they're a, a talking age like three four maybe even five uh you should not say why were you taken away from your parents don't you miss your mom things things about their bio parents um, or just anything asking for more information or even asking us in front of them because kids are always listening i would say one and a half and up ages one and a half and up they're gonna be starting to comprehend what the conversations are about um so yeah, I guess just negative talk about the bio parents or prying questions um, probably won't be good for the kids to hear because they're probably really missing their parents and confused about all these new people and why are these my new parents? They're just, I think it's many new things at once. And so things that you can do with them is what you would do with any three and four year old play with blocks and color and be silly and talk about things that they like um yeah i guess just enter into their world um and not not need to know the details of why they're here with us and i guess if there's special tantrums or last minute cancellations of events that we have to cancel um, i think being understanding of that because we're all, they're adjusting to this new family and this new routine, and we're adjusting to this new person in our family. Um, so sometimes that will mean we just gotta stay home and keep things simple. Um, yeah, can you think of anything else? Uh, in terms of don'ts or just anything? Do's or don'ts or do's, anything do's else. or don'ts. I mean, you know, just be friendly um, to the foster kid. Treat Try to treat them like you would treat Clive or Tove. Um, if they, um, you know, if there's a, a, a tantrum or bad situation, um, you know, get us involved. Uh, we'd love to, to parent that. Often a kid who's traumatized, who may be triggered, um, needs different parenting um, than, um, you know, you, that might be your kind of knee-jerk knee or uh, reaction or um, go-to reaction. So, um, you know, come to us. Um, like if we're not there. 
uh, for an another room or something, but just, you know, trust that we're, we've done a lot of training on how to um, parent these kids. Um, and, you know, check in with us, see, uh, over the years, like, add, you know, stay in touch, ask how we're doing, reach out, bring us food. Um, last question, what kind of support system do you have to help mm. you with this huge undertaking? Yeah, so we have a great support system. God's really blessed us. Um, you know, in addition to just the, the friends and family and neighbors that we already you know, have around naturally, um, like my you know parents being just uh, half an hour away and be having a lot of energy and capability to babysit or just help out or be around. Um, we have an official uh, group of people who have signed up uh, specifically to help us um, with foster care. It's through a group called Foster the City, uh, which is a, a Christian organization that helps um, uh, Christians and churches um, support foster families. So it's through our church. Uh, there's about 10 people uh, signed up uh, who go to our church and, and who we know. And, um, and there's one leader. And so when we have uh, requests or needs, we can send it to the leader. Uh, she can send it to the group and people can jump in to help with, uh, you know, if we need a meal or help with groceries or errands, um, if we need some babysitting, uh, or other logistical help, someone needs a ride, um, soccer practice or something, um, people are, are ready to help, but um, expectation is, you know, they're gonna help us with one uh, physical need every month and one emotional need like um, praying or talking on the phone with us every month. Um, so, you know, really, really great support system. Um, and you know my work has has proven that they're very flexible um, and and willing to adapt and help me with with tasks and stuff. Um, yeah, uh, and I presume you weren't talking about support system like for our back and the car. <laughs> the last attempt at a joke. Um, well, thanks for watching our long video. Thanks. You know my adult. I don't like this joke, but thanks for coming to our TED Talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and just thanks those of you who have said that, who know about this and want to be supportive. Um, we're really excited and nervous, and um, but just encouraged that many of you have uh, just been supportive along the way and wanting to help and um, excited along with us. So thanks for that. And we love you, and we're excited to go on this journey and have you along. And stay tuned for the blooper reel. Just kidding, we didn't do a blooper reel.